On the night that Jesus was born, an angel appeared to the shepherds in the fields around Bethlehem and told them of the birth of their Savior. And after that message was delivered, it says that the sky lit up. And it wasn't just one angel, but it was thousands upon thousands of angels. And they were saying in a loud voice, at the top of their supernatural lungs, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. At least that's how the King James language translates it. Glory to God in the highest, as if in heaven we are giving glory to God. We are giving glory to God in the highest place. And on earth... Peace, goodwill toward men. Usually this is interpreted as if we're going to glorify God in the high place in heaven and on earth. You all show each other goodwill. You all get along, which is definitely not a bad thing, a bad um, word of advice. But we look at it kind of like, like the first part is a proclamation. The last part is an admonition, something we're supposed to do. And some of us look at Christmas as that way. But in fact... That last part is a proclamation too. It's not a declaration of goodwill from man to man, from one human being from another. It's a declaration of goodwill from God. If you look at it in the NIV translation, a more modern translation, the the KJV doesn't exactly, um, while we're more familiar with it, we hear it more frequently, the NIV captures this Perhaps in a, in a true way, more to the original Greek, it says, The angels were saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom His favor rests. Maybe we can see it a little bit more clearly there. The favor, the goodwill, is God's. It's God's favor. Peace to those on whom His favor, God's favor, rests. Now, I hope that uh, in your Christmas gatherings this year, many have their gatherings have already taken place, or some are traveling on the way now to those gatherings, or expecting to gather with family and friends in the coming days. And I hope that all of your gatherings are filled with nothing but goodwill, that there's all goodwill around your table as you celebrate holidays and Christmas uh, in the coming days, but... I also know reality, okay, and in reality, we have personality clashes. There'll be people around the table that we don't necessarily like or get along with that well. There are things that have happened in the last year that have created tension in relationships. Perhaps there is grief around that table about relationships that are strained or have been lost in the last year. Or maybe it's even like bigger than that. Maybe it's about bigger issues, political issues, or social issues, or social behavior, or religious beliefs, or whatever it is that's creating tension in your relationships that boils over into tension in society. It seems that like while we hear tolerance preached to us more than ever, that we are less tolerant that we have ever been when it comes to people that don't agree with us or see things differently than us or that we just don't get along with them. I just would rather look at my phone than even have to deal with you right now. And I can do that. I can just like listen to who I want to and uh, not pay any attention, not to tolerate you at all. And is this message about Christmas, is this deliverance of this message from the angel, when we see what the angels are actually saying, which this is kind of very revelationist. I mean, if you get this vision of myriads of angels saying a coherent message, it sounds like a little creepy to me. I don't know. I would be freaked out if I were to have that kind of vision to get the glimpse into the supernatural realm and to see uh, what's happening. Uh, is, is God the same way? Is God's favor the same way? Since this goodwill is from us to, or from God to us and not from, like, from man to man, from God to humanity, is is God picking favorites? Here's another translation of that, New, New Revised Standard Version. Here's the way they interpret it. Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom he favors. Like, P 
peace if he likes you. Peace if you're in the good camp, okay? If, if God favors you, if he tolerates you, you'll get peace. Is that what this message is saying? Well, in truth, this is a very radical declaration. Because the angels are saying that because of what has happened, because of what has happened in Bethlehem with the birth of this child, this historical event, something profound has happened in the relationship of God and humanity. And that message could be also said, look what God is willing to tolerate for your good. I mean, goodwill is to will someone's good. Look what God is willing to tolerate for you. Go to Bethlehem. You'll find him wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a donkey's feeding trough, a manger. Brush aside all the feces, and there will be the Son of God in the manger. What? Let's back up a little bit and see how we got here. When we talk about tolerating what we're willing to tolerate for God or for peace or what God is willing to tolerate for us. Let's go back to the beginning of this story in Matthew chapter 1. In Luke chapter 2, it tells us the story from the perspective of Mary and the Bethlehem story. It's the, it's, it's a more detailed in Luke, Matthew kind of gives us a concise version uh, from Joseph's perspective. And he says uh, in verse 18 of chapter 1, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. She was engaged. Being pledged to be married to someone was something that happened at a very early age, probably like 10 years of age or younger. I mean, the, the marriages were arranged by parents. You didn't pick who you married. Some of you are like freaking out about that. Some of you, some of you are like, yeah, that's a great plan, especially if you're a parent. You might be thinking that. And, uh, and that's the way that they did it. It was all arranged. And so it was decided years in advance that Joseph would be her husband. But this is before they have been married. Perhaps Mary is in her early teens. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Before they came together, before they were married, before they had sex, she was pregnant. Whoa, whoa. Automatically, there is a stigma. And while it doesn't say so, this reality that a girl pledged to be married is pregnant not by the one she is engaged to. To be pregnant would be bad enough. But she's pregnant not by Joseph. Now, um, I'm sure everyone in Nazareth believed the whole pregnant by the Holy Spirit bit. You know, and, and Mary told him there's an angel, and he said it was just, I, I, just I, it was a miracle. I'm sure they are parents bought it, and their neighbors and all the town gossips in Nazareth which would have been a town smaller than Wetumpka, okay? We're talking only a few hundred people lived in the village of Nazareth. They didn't ha have garages where you pulled your car, you shut the garage, you never saw your neighbors. No, they were very much intertwined. News traveled fast, okay? Word would have gotten out. But apparently they tried to keep it quiet because Joseph is going to kind of keep it quiet. Joseph doesn't buy it, okay? Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and so he did not want to expose her to public disgrace. She's committed a crime that could be charged as adultery, effectively was adultery, and the penalty for adultery was death by stoning. And so Joseph doesn't want that to happen to her. He's it's interesting that it's described as being faithful to the law, but he wants mercy for her. He doesn't want to expose her to public disgrace, although he had, he could have, he'd had every right to humiliate her for what she had done to him. 
I mean, you think about when someone hurts you, sometimes what's your natural reaction is to kind of humiliate them publicly, especially even, even if it's someone you care about deeply. And it says something about Joseph's character that he wouldn't do that, that he didn't want to do that. And so he had in mind to divorce her quietly. He's going to do his part to kind of keep this quiet, to protect Mary, even though it is apparent that she has done something very, very wrong and been unfaithful to him. When in truth, she hasn't done anything wrong. She's been identified because she loves God and she's been chosen to be this instrument. But being chosen by God means tolerating disgrace and humiliation in the eyes of peers. And so now that humiliation will not be Mary's alone. It will also be Joseph's. Joseph, it turns out that not just Mary is chosen. Joseph is chosen too. And he says that an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Some, I know people who've had angels to visit them and to speak to them. And uh, like they, you think they're crazy. You think, well, that's, they just imagine that. And they don't think so. Joseph had that kind of experience. He had a, an angel appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. The fact that Joseph is a descendant of David is significant because the Messiah was, would, would be a son of David. And so Joseph's lineage is important in all of this. Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because, guess what? She isn't lying. It really is by the Holy Spirit that she is pregnant. And so, Joseph, put all your plans on hold. Everything that you thought your life would be like has suddenly changed. You imagine Joseph, this young man, he's a carpenter in his 20s. He's engaged. He's looking forward to be married. And so, he's discovered that not only is his bride to be pregnant, but but and and not carrying his child, but that now that he's going to have to raise a child who is not his, and he doesn't even get to pick the name. Verse 21, she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his his people from their sins. Jesus the comes from the Hebrew word Yeshua, which means the Lord saves. Joseph, his plans are interrupted. And not only does he have interrupted plans for his life, but he will bear humiliation and disgrace. Because maybe they kept it quiet. Let's just say that they did. Um, when suddenly your wedding gets moved up, okay, and your wife is pregnant, and, it's, and you know, people can count to nine months, okay? They can count months, they knew something was going on. They had to have had. Word would have gotten out. But Joseph and Mary are willing to tolerate the discomfort, the, the disgrace, the humiliation, the interruption in their life plans to be obedient to God. But maybe even that wasn't the kicker for Joseph. Because it wasn't just what Joseph was asked to do. It was what God was doing. Because this was, this was so significant. It's so significant that it's by the Holy Spirit that she was pregnant. That it was God's initiation. Because this fulfills the word of the prophet. It's, it's what the, as the angel says to him, or as the scripture tells us, Matthew in verse 22 that it, this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said to the prophet. And the prophet was Isaiah. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. And then Matthew gives us a, a description of what Emmanuel means because this is important. It means God with us. Now that scripture, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, that had been around for 700 years. And when it was first spoken... It was believed that Isaiah was prophesying about a maiden, a, the young wife of the king of Ahaz, king Ahaz of Judah, who would have a son, 
Hezekiah, who would be a righteous king and would be a reminder to the people, a symbol, a sign that God was with them because this was to be a sign that this young woman would have a child. And in fact, the Hebrew word could be virgin, it could be young woman. But the Christians who read this and those who wrote Matthew's gospel and everyone who came after Jesus, they recognized that this was speaking not just about Hezekiah. That it wasn't just about a young maiden. But that other interpretation, virgin, could apply. And not just a king to remind us of God's presence among us. And to be a sign of God's presence. But to literally... To literally be God with us. God taking up flesh. God walking around. God speaking to the wind and waves. God, when he cuts, he bleeds. God suffering, dying on a cross. God with us. So maybe Joseph caught a glimpse in that moment. Of what was really happening here. Not just what they had to tolerate. But what God was tolerating for them. So that his people could be saved from their sins. At least that's what the angel said. Name him Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. So it raises the question, who are his people? Those on whom his favor rests? If he likes you, if he gets along with you, if if you do the right things, if you please him, if you stay in good favor, his goodwill toward you, who are his people? His friends? No. 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 Look at this, in Colossians chapter 1, this radical idea that Paul elaborates for us and that explains who this message, peace on earth, goodwill toward men, is for. Not for his friends. That's what's so significant about it. Paul, Colossians 1.21, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, you weren't doing what God wanted, what God said, and you knew it. You knew in your minds that you were his enemies and that's why you were looking for every other way to fill that void in your life. But here's what God did. Here's what God did at Christmas. Now he has reconciled you. Reconciled means to make peace. God gives peace to us by making peace with us. And he has reconciled you how? By Christ's physical body. By a physical body, a body made of flesh, a body born of Mary on Christmas. A God or a human being divine and human by a God who takes up human flesh reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death through his death this is how we are reconciled his blood for our sins and if you go back a couple of verses I didn't put these on the screen but in verses 18 and 19 of Colossians chapter 1 he describes Jesus as the firstborn over all creation and the image of the invisible God That he is the God in the flesh. He is God taking up human flesh. This incredible mystery that we can't imagine. Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. No accusation against you. That you are reconciled. There is nothing that can be held against you. With one condition. If you continue in your faith, 
established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. You see, this peace that God offers, it isn't just to those who do what he wants, to those who are in good with him, with his camp, okay? No. This peace is offered not on the basis of behavior, but on faith in God's favor as expressed through a Savior who gave his life for you. Peace comes not by right behavior, but by faith in God's favor. When it comes to whether I have right standing with God or not, whether or not God has favorable thinking and opinions toward me, whether or not God wills my good, or is he holding these things over my head? He just can't wait to bring them back up at the right time. I'm never sure where my relationship stands with him. I'm never feeling secure or, or that I'm truly accepted. We're not sure. Are we really at peace? Are we really good in this relationship? That's if, am I good enough? No. The peace is on the basis of the message of the angels at the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. God's good will, God's favor is now given to you in Jesus. And so you receive that peace not by right behavior, but by faith in God's favor. And it's that faith that leads to right behavior. And so the message of the angel is that Christmas means God's favor is extended to all. It's available to everyone. It can be received by anyone because of what is happening at Christmas. Isn't that good news? That's what the word gospel means. That's what Paul said at the end of verse 23 that this is my gospel. This is the good news. Sometimes we kind of forget that Christianity is good news. God's favor extended to all. And so here's where this is, I mean, that's so important for us. But here's where it works out in our relationships with other people and to term peace on earth, okay? Peace has come to earth. God has come to earth to make peace with us. But here's how this transforms our relationships. If God can have goodwill toward us when we were his enemies, if God could tolerate us when we were his enemies, and not just tolerate us, but have goodwill toward us and desire good for us, can't we have goodwill toward each other? If God can have goodwill toward us when we were his enemies, can't we have goodwill toward each other? If God can tolerate the humiliation of becoming a human being and of taking up human flesh and of, all, of being laid in a donkey's feeding trough, a manger, with all the smells of the barnyard, okay? Not exactly a royal entrance into the world. If he can humble himself in this way, I can endure slights. I can tolerate someone who, who does me wrong, who shows me disrespect, who, who maybe even is dishonest with me and does wrong toward me. I can tolerate injustice. I can tolerate around being around somebody who has behaviors that offend me and maybe I disagree with. Because you know what? That's how God treated me. When I was doing all of those things, God loved me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God loved us when we were far from him. Romans 5, 8 says that even when we were sinners, Christ died for us. Now, this doesn't mean that we change our standards, that we say wrong is right 
that we stay quiet just to get along, that we don't speak up, that um, we compromise on our values for the sake of getting along and having peace. It doesn't mean that at all. Compromise on our values or our beliefs or say it doesn't matter. Jesus didn't do that. But Jesus did live this out. In Matthew 5, 44, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That you may be children of your father to mirror the heart of your father. He calls his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Goodwill favor. Even toward your enemies. That's because that's what God did. And what God does every day. And that's why the heart of a peacemaker, someone who has found peace with God and now offers the peace of God, mirrors the heart of their heavenly father they are the children of god they found peace with god they've been reconciled with god they're the prodigal son who's come home and been received in open arms by their heavenly father they are children of god and they reflect the heart of their father so this is what god tolerated for you He didn't lower his standards in terms of righteousness and holiness and right and wrong. He didn't compromise on his holiness. But he did lower his standards in terms of what he would tolerate in terms of taking up human flesh. A God who fills all things, is all powerful, becoming a one cell. I mean, he started off as a one cell, the most fragile of all creation. And then a baby who can't feed himself, who can't control his bladder, depending upon a teenager for his daily sustenance and survival. A God becoming so vulnerable, humbling himself for us. See, God is a peacemaker. God is a peacemaker. Making peace with us. And what he tolerated can give us a new perspective on what we can tolerate for the sake of peace. Again, not compromising, having to compromise your conviction, beliefs, or truth, but desiring the goodwill of those who might be perceived to be opposed or even enemies that are your enemies. And so I wonder if it was that kind of a vision that this message is what struck Joseph to the core. Like when he considered the words of the angel and the words of the prophet that he would be God with us. That now Joseph was given the responsibility of being a father to the Son of God. To raise a child not his own, who was to be the savior of the world. And they already kind of had an inkling, at least Mary did, that Jesus would have to die for the world to be saved through him. A sword will pierce your own heart too. A prophet told her she would agonize, she would hurt, she would lose her son. And so perhaps this vision of what God would tolerate, that it helped Joseph, it made it an easy decision for him. God can tolerate this for me. I can tolerate some discomfort, some disgrace, having my plans interrupted, the humiliation of the scorn of unfounded and accusations and gossip. And so when he woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded. And he took Mary home as his wife. And it says that he gave, when the child was born, he gave him the name, the angel said, he gave him the name Jesus. If God was willing to tolerate that for us, for the sake of our peace, can't we tolerate slights? 
and having to hear opinions we don't agree with, maybe even that we know are wrong or immoral. Can we tolerate that for the sake that the other person might be able to have peace? Not that we have to agree, but that we don't cut someone off in the perspective of the one who came to us to offer us peace. For that goodwill, the goodwill the angel proclaimed, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. That goodwill is God's. And that goodwill is extended to all who will receive it. And it's extended to you. Have you received it? Will you receive it? Will you believe it? Not based on right behavior, but on faith in God's favor. Will you believe it? Will you share it? It's offered to you. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That whoever believes in him should have peace. How does peace come to the world? It comes by us making peace with God and then sharing that peace with others. Have you found that peace? Will you receive it today?